night on a really nice, right. really nice night. And um, okay, so there we go. So this we um, are having our program for the um, our communal wildlife habitat project. And so the whole idea is that we are an island in harmony with nature and we get a lot of people that are landscaping for wildlife and that's been um, quite successful. We're now at 1002 um, backyard wildlife habitats and um, it's important because if you look at what um, what what we looked like in 1984 there's enough development then but now you look at 2020 and there's some um, real um, development has gone on. So rather than um, sob when the, the logs roll off the island, this is our action step on the island. So if we do things in our backyards, we're linking up our yards with the parks and trying to restore some corridors. So this is um, what you can do. If you look at the, the picture of the before, this is my yard and this is not the um, beginning of it. it the, the part on the left side of the trail, that used to be all grass. And um, we worked with that. We put short pines in, and now there's salal and um, and um, wild um, rose and various things that have grown up in the left side. And then the right side, we've we've kind of done the same except for the short pine. So the right side, you can see it's it's like a nature path to get from my garage down to um, where my house is. And so we didn't do this as a um, all at once situation. We started the Backyard Wildlife Project in 2002. So in 2002, there was grass on the left side of the path and the right side. In 2007, the left side, we had started to work on that. And then there's boxes all throughout our yard. We have no grass any longer. And um, so now on a nice hot day, I'll go up the steps to my, um, to my yard up above on the hill and the neighbors will have grass and dried grass and a lot of heat and I have this oasis. It's quite nice and I can tell you the bunnies are hiding under it right now. So for a wildlife habitat you're providing food, water, shelter and places to raise young and um, by doing that you can certify with the National Wildlife Federation and you're providing the essentials for wildlife. Besides that there's thinking about sustainable gardening. So by reducing lawn, if you have grass and a tree, it's not a very, um, it's kind of a sterile environment. So if you grow some natives, add some plants like you, that you like. I like lilacs, I like to sniff them. So I, I, I do have lilacs and um, so you don't have to be a purist, but what it does is conserves water. And we know that's a big deal on an island that has a sole source aquifer. So um, water conservation is a big deal. Actually, it is all over. And then um, pesticide use, reducing that or eliminating it's even better. And so there's, there's different things you can do in your garden beyond just um, doing the food, water, um, places to raise young and shelter. There's also what you're actually doing. Like I have my bird bath and, I, and now I make sure that it's full and that it's clean. And, um, and my yards linking up with the other yards in my neighborhood. So it's, it's kind of a community action step, we like to think. So to certify your yard, there's, um, it's a simple application. It shows how you're providing food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. Like I said, we have 1,002 on the island now. And, um, and people kind of sometimes say, oh, you know, I'm doing it. I don't need to certify. But when you certify, you're actually a part of something. And, and it's quite cool. Right now, there are 140 community wildlife habitats in the nation. And Kamena was the tenth, and there are eighteen in the state, and Kamena was the second. So it's um it's an action step, and it makes you more conscientious. You start to think, okay, I, I want to get some new plants, so I can get plants that are helpful for the wildlife, or they're really just kind of show pieces and don't do much but uh, show, or they're invasive, and and aren't going to help wildlife and are going to uh, clear out the native plants. So it makes us a lot more thoughtful about what goes into our yards and how it's helping us be an island in harmony with nature. Because most of us move to the island because uh, it's, it's such a beautiful place. And it's such a beautiful place for the superficial beauty, but also because it, it's doing a lot for the critters. So once you certify, you can let other people know. And if you do that, we have signs. So the Kameno sign, 
is $15 and I can meet you at the park and ride at Terry's Corner if you want to. You need to be certified to have the sign, but I get calls from people that want to certify um, because they want the sign. So if you're one of those, we're working on 1,100 certified habitats now, now that we reached 1,000. You can also get Ranger Rick if you like Ranger Rick and that sign, and that sign you get from the National Wildlife Federation once you certify. So here's all the dots on the island, and this is only when we had 700, so envision 302 more dots on the island, and you'll know that there's people doing this all throughout the island, which is very cool. And these are all the people that are doing it in the, all the communities in the state. So it's an action step. It makes us think about what we're doing in our yards. And it really makes a difference because if more people do it, then we are linking up corridors. Oh, and I forgot to say the application you can get on our website. And then you can send it into Camino, um, Friends of Camino Island Parks, which sponsors us. And I count and sh kind of shepherd your application. Or you can go online with the National Wildlife Federation and just do it automatically. So either way, it works. And I also have applications at the library, both inside and in a little kiosk outside of the library. So more information, you can get it at um, our website, Camino Wildlife Habitat, or you can get um, lots of information from National Wildlife Federation as well. So with that, here are some books. The two at the top, Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife, are written by Russell Link, who is a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife, State Fish and Wildlife Department. And then the bottom one is written by a naturalist of, uh, with the National Wildlife Federation. So with that, I will um, introduce our speaker. So thank you for coming and listening to my spiel. Uh, and we do these programs the third Wednesday of the month as part of our um, wildlife project, either about plants or the critters. So tonight it's just about the critters. And let me unshare. Okay. So with that, I'll introduce Heidi. And Heidi is a professor, Heidi Island, Dr. Heidi Island is a professor of comparative animal behavior and neuroscience at Pacific University in Oregon. She's also a senior research associate with the Oregon Zoo. She is the principal investigator of a four-year study on, in Island County on the North American River otters. And her interests in, are in the welfare of the otter population in the Pacific Northwest. She um, also, her work focuses on the distribution, diet and foraging behaviors of um, the otters. And um, she's interested in their social learning, their natural foraging outlets and their psychological welfare. So with that, thank you so much, um, Dr. Heidi Island and um, here she is to tell us about otters. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. And um, can you guys see this OK? Thumbs looks, up. OK. Looks great. Excellent. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the mission of a Camino Wildlife Habitat Project. Um, I live in McMinnville, Oregon uh, for most of the year. I'm a professor at Pacific, as Val said. Um, and we just purchased um, an old homestead. And uh, our goal has been to um, reintroduce native species, which means that we've been spending an enormous amount of time getting rid of Blackberry Bramble. Um, I just started taking a class at OSU, Oregon State University has a uh, beekeeping program that's all online. So if any of you are interested in being a beekeeper, I cannot um, recommend it enough. It's super, it's really, really easy uh, in terms of um, ease of processing and fluidity of technology, um, although I will tell you that um, beekeeping is more complicated than I anticipated, but it's great science. So um, if you're interested in that, um, I can't endorse it enough. Um, okay, so let's talk about some otters. Um, my research is in two veins. One is field research and the other is um, 
captive rescued animals. Um, so the Oregon Zoo has two different otters, the same otters that Washington has. There are 13 global otter species. Um, two of those live in Washington. Um, the northern sea otter, uh, not to be confused with the southern sea otter, this is actually uh, the subspecies that the Oregon Zoo has that I do behavioral work with. Um, but then also the North American river otter, both um, at the Oregon Zoo, these uh, populations or, or residents um, were rescues. So they were not um, uh, captive born. They were animals that were orphaned, um, both from the Pacific Northwest, the sea otters were orphaned um, in Monterey Bay and the river otters were orphaned in Oregon and Washington. So genetically um, really close in terms of subspecies, uh, often there's speciation that occurs within smaller populations where they go geographically and that particular subspecies becomes unique. Um, the, uh, um, I just lost it. Whales, the gray whales, um, uh, have a, a subspecies that forages in the Salish Sea that was a branch from an original stock that goes um, north. And so um, some of these different geographical areas actually have unique um, behavior anomalies just based on the geography. So um, these are some of the things that I'm interested in. What's going on with Island County's otters? Um, how are they meaningful relative to understanding broader populations of otters? Um, but before we talk about uh, river otters, I should make some distinctions. For those of you that are um, repeat offenders in terms of coming to my talks. I apologize, this will be a little redundant, but um, I cannot uh, leave this slide out. Uh, folks frequently confuse river otters with sea otters. There are no sea otters, no permanent sea otters in the Salish Sea, which is Strait of Juan de Fuca, Georgia Strait, and Puget Sound. Um, the sea otters that we have in Washington originate from a reintroduced northern sea otter population from Alaska that was introduced in 1969 through 1970 from about um, 80 animals. So the animals that are now part of 2000 um, in uh, the Olympic Peninsula um, originated from between 10 to 43 surviving animals of the original 80. So um, you don't see, for the most part, if you do, it's really rare and unusual, but for the most part, you don't see sea otters in the Salish Sea. What you do see are river otters. So um, by comparison, your sea otters are roughly 35 pounds uh, for females. Um, and somewhere around 45 pounds for males. Uh, if you look at this relative to our river otters, considerably smaller. So our males are actually around the 35 pounds where you have somewhere around 25 pounds for females. Um, your sea otters are 90% of the time living in marine habitat where our river otters are only in um, marine or freshwater habitats about 30% of the time. Um, and when you see them, they're belly down. They look like kind of snake-like, whereas our sea otters are the quintessential on their backs, usually in rafts of more than one animal or females will have a pup on her belly. Um, so you don't, you don't typically see um, this kind of behavior with with river otters. When they're belly down, they're very low profile. They're really easy to confuse with a snag. Um, frequently, I get uh, skunked thinking I'm looking at a river otter, but it's actually a snag or it's a piece of bull kelp. Occasionally, it's a loon. Um, <laughs> so they, they, are, they are difficult to see unless you're close. But um, this kind of look here is a standard profile for a kin group. Um, their pelage is about 57,000 hairs per uh, cubic centimeter, uh, excuse me, a squared centimeter if you're looking at river otters, as opposed to 140,000 hairs per 
cubic or per, per square centimeter for sea otters. So a lot denser fur um, in sea otters. But the river otters also were heavily hunted for its fur. And often people will um, assert that they see bubble feeding or bubble blowing or something like that with the sea otters. And that is in fact a foraging strategy. Although generally what you're seeing is as they dive down, um, the air compresses on the pelage and it actually causes the bubbles um, to rise to the surface. So they blow air into the pelage, which is a fancy way of saying pelt or fur or coat. Um, and so as they dive down, that um, insulative air, uh, uh, air pocket uh, uh, pushes out and goes to the surface. That air pocket is part of what allows them to maintain their body temperature, but also to help them float. And so as they dive down, it's really important that they get rid of that. But it also limits how long they can be in the water. Generally, uh, a river otter's bout in water is limited to about 20 minutes. Otherwise, they start experiencing hypothermia. Um, in terms of uh, anatomy, we have feet as opposed to sea otters, which are flippered and feet. Um, offspring for sea otters is one, whereas offspring typically for river otters is anywhere between one and six animals, although generally of the six, only three or four um, will be surviving animals. Um, sexual maturity for sea otters is three to five years for females and five to seven years for males. Sexual maturity for river otters is two to three years in general. Um, in terms of kin groups, uh, the river otters are uh, kin group heavy. Usually what you're seeing, in fact, what you see in this image here is a kin group where you have a female and three um, offspring. And that's a really common grouping. It's called a romp. If, for those of you that collect your collective nouns, um, they're a romp unless they are mating and then they're called a tangle. The tangle is almost always in water. Um, although occasionally you'll see them trek onto land um, and continue their, their um, courtship, as it were, although it's a rather ferocious courtship, loud, sounds like fighting cats. Um, and sometimes that courtship will uh, spill in under your deck. So um, if you're looking at uh, habitat for your wildlife, sometimes that's a... Um, for some folks, an unpleasant consequence, usually around March, April, May is when, when that occurs. In terms of um, why we should care or why Northern uh, North American river otters are important, there's a number of reasons. One of which is that river otters are among the first species to disappear from polluted areas. Um, I have a salvage permit. These are four different animals just in the last year that I've salvaged. Um, Art Moxley, I need to give him a shout out from Camino uh, this last March. He let me know within 12 hours of a um, auto vehicle accident that had happened um, and he had come across the, the um, carcass and it was still reasonably warm. So um, he spent a lot of time actually finding a place to take it, he took it to um, Camino Veterinary Clinic. So a shout out to them as well because they stored it in cold storage for me. I was able to collect it two days or two weeks later um, and do essentially a necropsy and collect a liver sample. Um, this one is in Clinton. This is over uh, by Admiralty Bay and this as well by Admiralty Inlet. Um, the uh, um, injury that Art Moxley indicated, as I mentioned, is auto um, motive. Uh, the, the second one here um, was from last fall, and that was a gunshot wound. Um, I wasn't uh, clear that that's what it was until I did the necropsy, and um, whoever had shot her, she was um, nursing at the time. Uh, they, they were a good shot because it was fortunately a, a um, a fast death. Uh, this third image here was, for, uh, was the result of um, um, conspecific, probably conspecific uh, conflict. And this last one was likely, this was a pup, and this was likely just an abandoned pup. Um, often the males 
if they become too greedy, their resource needs are, are more um, than the female pups. And so if it becomes too much for the female, she will often um, abandon her male pups um, in favor of supporting the female pups that use less resources. So this is actually a broad cross section of the kind of things that um, Joseph Gatos and his colleagues found um, in looking at mortality rates. They, in 10 years, they had, um, I wanna say something in the order of like 35 carcasses that they looked at and um, the breakdown was very similar, except for they had a number of um, incidents of canine distemper uh, as well. So not just, um, and, as, and also ectoparasites, so not just automotive and inter, um, uh, conspecific conflict and gunshot, but also um, pathogenic. So um, they're the first to disappear from polluted areas. Um, they're also uh, important because they support interspecies competitors, uh, particularly um, our raptors. So frequently, if you're looking for otters, you should be paying attention. Are there eagles around? Are there heron around? Um, the reason for that is that raptors will eat the leavings of otters. Um, if the otters are well fed, they will usually eat the belly and then go to the tail and then eventually get up to the head. And if there is um, plenty of resources, they'll leave the head and the heron and the eagle will take that. Um, and so they're, they're supported for, for other competitors besides just otters. They're also apex predators. And this is important because um, apex predators bioaccumulate um, pollutants. So the, the small fish, you know, or the, the plankton is eaten by the small fish and the small fish is eaten by the larger and the larger is eaten by yet a larger uh, uh, animal. And then that animal is eaten by top predators. And every single step along the way, each of those different prey items are exposed to antibiotics. They're exposed to uh, brominated flame retardants. They're exposed to mercury. They may be exposed to any number of other um, persistent organopollutants. Those accumulate in the liver and those get passed on to the next consumer. Um, for apex predators, it becomes additive, it bioaccumulates. And so what that, can, that does um, as a researcher is it tells us a little bit about the health of the habitat. It tells us a little bit about the health of the watershed. Um, ideally, we wouldn't see that, but if any of you have been following um, the orca populations, particularly the southern residents, although they're doing well this year and years past, um, they were doing less well. And part of what you saw was starvation that occurred, not just because um, their salmon resource was depleted, but also because once that weight loss starts to occur, um, all of those docked toxins that are in the flat fat cells, all of those persistent organic pollutants become bioavailable and they start to shut down um, organ function. And so um, often you'll see less functionality among animals that have been relatively healthy once they start losing weight because um, all of those docked um, organic pollutants that are, or inorganic pollutants that are in the fat cells circulate. So um, apex predators are important for that. They're also important in terms of the transfer of marine derived or, uh, nitrogen to the terrestrial ecosystem, as well as to freshwater ecosystems, just in terms of making it um, more viable so that you don't have anaerobic um, uh, organisms occupying your fresh water. As a research subject, they're important because they don't hibernate. They have 24 hour activity. They're referred to as crepuscular. When you look at some of my um, findings from the last two years, in terms of their activity, this will be really apparent. They're most active at dawn and dusk. So you don't have a nocturnal animal or a diurnal animal, you have a crepuscular animal, which means they could be seen 24 hours. Um, but generally the activity is greatest right at twilight, whether it's dawn or dusk. And so right as the sun is emerging or setting, that's when your best chances to see otters. Although um, right now and in May, you had, a, you had a pretty good chance of seeing them throughout uh, the day because of mating season. 
Also, they have really adaptable, flexible diets, and hopefully you'll see this as well um, as I talk a little bit about their um, food choices. Um, they have adaptable foraging behavior. They go from fresh to marine habitat, and they can do this within minutes. The um, Admiral Cove otters that are in Coopville, um, they, uh, within 60 meters, there is fresh water as well as Admiralty Bay. So it's a little um, sort of spit between two, two bodies of water, um, freshwater lake and saltwater bay. And they go between the two. And in fact, they frequently enter the bay through a culvert um, that has a tie gate into fresh water. And that's great for them because the salt, they have to get out of their, their, their collage. And so they forage around for 10, 15 minutes in the bay. They get their sculpin, their flatfish, they tuck back into the culvert and move have, with their meal, usually have a free and clear area where they can eat unmolested from the heron and eagles in the area. Don't have to worry about people. Don't have to worry about some crazy lady with a camera following them around trying to get a picture. Um, and then they move right back into their, into their freshwater habitat where they're nesting and denning. And then um, they're seasonally territorial. This is beneficial because they are scent markers. So um, the scent marking is referred to as latrines. These are not just places where they scat. These are places where they scat that they have very high fidelity for. They go back again and again and again. They mark it. If somebody else marks it, they say, no, this is my spot. They mark over it. Um, there have been a number of studies of, of um, otter researchers that I, I guess had a lot of time, um, but took scat from one latrine from a different otter and put it in an established latrine of a different territorial otter um, to see, you know, essentially what they did and they don't like this. So they will mark over somebody else's marking. Um, and this is really how they establish territory. And it's not necessarily something that they will heavily guard or protect unless it's mating season. It's really more to establish boundaries. It's like property lines. This is my spot. You need to move on and find a new spot. Um, and often too, it lets folks know, um, lets otters know, you know, who's there. So you may have offspring that are coming back to a natal area and then they realize that mom or sister is there and they should move on or they'll come for brief bouts and reconnect with mom or sister and then they'll leave again usually the females don't uh, tolerate them for for, for very long um, but they will sometimes reconnect um, following weaning um, additionally they're sensitive to pollution um, and so and they're living in year-round exposure. This is um, unfortunate, but useful as a researcher because it means that even though they don't actually have very much in the way of liver or uh, fat reserves, they do store all of those chemicals in their liver. This is a picture that Jan Ledbetter took. She's a brilliant photographer at Coopville. Um, and I don't know if you can see, um, this particular otter has a tumor along the lower jaw. What's also meaningful about these guys is they're a least concerned species. And so you might be saying, well, why mess with them if they're a least concerned species? Well, they're a least concerned species, um, which means that we still have an opportunity to make sure that they stay that way. So rather than trying to go in and protect them after the fact, like we're doing with sea otters, we can try and um, monitor their population density now so that we don't end up having a dearth of otters. They are not um, necessarily... Um, a keystone species in the way that sea otters are, but they are an indicator species, which is really important for the ecology. Um, why study island otters? Well, hopefully I'll show you that um, they are all over the place. Um, I have over uh, 200 people that will send emails or text me or um, will send me a little thing on Instagram. Um, I really worked hard to cultivate those folks that are interested. Um, and these are some of the areas along Whidbey, and you'll see that all of the areas along Whidbey and Camino are pretty well represented from folks who have seen them. Um, this is the deck of Carl and Jan Smith in Bush Point, which is um, in Freeland. Also on Camino, this is Janina Thompson. Um, 
they had a romp of otters on their property. This is a really cute video, but um, I will save it till the end if we have time. Pam Stein and Oak Carver from Strawberry Point. Rebecca Jaffrey from Freeland. I'll show this really quick. This is a classic culvert otter move. Um, so you won't see them. And then all of a sudden you'll hear some rustling around in the water. And all of a sudden the otter will peek its head out. Usually this is, this is referred to as an ecotone. It's an area between two different habitats, usually freshwater and saltwater. Um, and so this is their, this is sort of their established shoots and ladders approach of getting from one to the other without having to worry about predators or anyone messing with them. Um, in Admiralty Bay, um, uh, Teresa Savaro um, had a great um, uh, video. It looks like I didn't, oh, there it is. Great little video of an otter that brought a starry flounder up onto her back porch. Um, this is pretty typical. This is low bank area. You can expect this in any low bank area. If you haven't seen them and you're on a low bank area, it's because you haven't seen them. They are there, I promise. And um, this is Susan uh, Carpenter at Bell's Beach um, on the east, uh, southeast side of um, uh, Whidbey. This is just a some deaf otters as well. Um, Joe Lapati of Clinton um, had some great, I'll take this off, had some great um, mating footage of otters just um, at Skagit, uh, Scratchit Head. And if you can't see what they're doing there, um, Ty Kent, who is a brilliant photographer out of Port Townsend, um, also very generous with his time. Uh, he and my research assistant who came to Whidbey this summer did a little walkabout with him. He has amazing photos. Um, if you go to Instagram or Facebook, he's one of the photographers on Washington Natural uh, Nature and Wildlife Photography. His name's Ty Kent and he has some of the best uh, river otter footage I've ever seen or photos that I've ever seen. So um, we have healthy population of North American river otters in Island County. These are all of the, um, the reported latrines um, around Island County. It looks a lot like the dots that Val was showing concerning um, backyard wildlife habitat. Very similar. Um, in fact, just in this one small area where the Whidbey Island Research Station is, this is the number of dens. So just in this tiny little area, these are reported dens. These would be um, separate years, different animals, um, different romps. And so it's really quite a, a, a terrific um, locked community of, of marine uh, mammals um, in terms of study. This um, constitutes two types of otter activity if we're looking at um, actual observation, which is primary um, uh, otter activity. And then secondary otter activity is animal sign. In this video, which is one of my infrared cameras, you're seeing a romp. Um, and, um, and it's so funny, it's doing, it's doing um, closed captioning of me, it's so weird. Anyway, you're seeing a romp here that is latrining. And so you have both direct observation or primary, and then you'll have secondary because it's making a nest right here. This is also rolling behavior. They're marking, they have scent glands on their back hind feet. This is, um, as my research assistant likes to say, the otter twerk, which is just also referred to as latrine dance. This is part of how they um, push out strength, which is a combination of feces, urine, and a kind of digestive mucus. Um, referred to as jelly. And they use that to coat and protect um, the, the fish that they're consuming at, uh, so that their, their intestinal walls and their stomach aren't damaged from the spines. Again, a little twerk. Um, but this gives you both types of primary and secondary otter activity. And in the terms of the what we're collecting for most of what we're doing, it's animal sign. We're interested in um, tracks, we're interested in scat, um, hair and fur, marking stations, these are the latrines, the dis disturbed soil that you just saw, 
Um, and then also choose or gnaws. Sometimes you'll see that along the banks of um, the lake or uh, the bay. And then any sleeping spaces. So dens are typically old snags. They are not um, underground for the most part, at least in Island County. You'll see old snags. You'll see little nests of bulrushes. Sometimes you'll see under decks. Um, those are all important areas for animal sign. Um, also, you want to look in transitional areas. So main trails, runs, or anytime you have high grass and they run through, you'll see essentially that initial trail. And then, of course, um, escape, escape routes like culverts. Um, what we collect is scat. Um, this is really sprained. It's a liquid form of both feces um, and urine better known as poo. This is what that looks like. This is fresh 24 hour uh, scat. If it's older, it will be white or gray. That's not what we need. We need 24 hour um, uh, um, sprint. Um, and this stuff tells us about diet composition. It tells us about their health. We can collect hormone data from that. We can get DNA from the tissues. All of that is super helpful. This is the digestive jelly I was telling you about before. It's a little unappetizing. Um, I don't find the feces to smell particularly bad. Um, if it's out in the open and it's ventilated, it has kind of an Earl Grey smell, a little musky, a little Earl Grayish. But if you have the digestive mucus on top, um, that, that will usually spoil the bouquet. Um, this is not always present. So it's thought, and we don't know a lot about this, but it's thought that it's primarily deposited by males and it's seasonally specific. You see more of the digestive mucus in the fall than you do in the spring and summer. And this is true for the latrining as well. You'll see more latrining in the fall and the winter than you'll see in the spring and the summer. So what do we do with the poo? Um, well, we, we look at it relative to two different populations, not just the Island County otters, but also um, captive otters. So uh, when you have a captive or rescued population of animals um, or lots of them, as we have in zoos and aquariums, the best way to establish what wellness is, is to look at a healthy native population and go, do our glucocorticoids like cortisol um, match uh, in captivity as they do in um, a natural environment. If it's a healthy, unstressed population, which we think certainly it is um, in Island County, for the last uh, three years that I've been collecting data, I frequently see some of the same animals. Um, that's a pretty good timeline for an otter. They can live up to 15 to 20 years in captivity, but they're lucky to make it to five in um, native environments. So um, there are a lot of otters in Island County and there are a lot of long living otters in Island County. And so we're using them as a model of here's what a healthy population is. Um, or populations. They have abundant food. There are lots of freshwater lakes. Um, there are lots of freshwater ponds. There is um, 200, just on Whidbey alone, 200 square miles of ocean front uh, that they can um, occupy, although just 50 miles from one end to the other. If you're looking at the circumference of that 200 miles, essentially, of, of, of coastal area that they can potentially exploit. So um, why do we study the rescued captive otters? What can we learn from them at all? Why bother with them when we can do field work? Well, there's a few things that are meaningful. Um, first of all, it allows us to look at animals and consistently see what they're doing in a behavioral context. But then once we have that, we need to know if we're providing a healthy environment. They serve all kinds of purposes um, in a captive context. They are ambassadors in education. Often the only time people will see animals of that kind, they can't be reintroduced back into the wild if they're rescued. Often um, these animals are referred to as um, a domesticated. Both the sea otters and the river otters at the Oregon Zoo are this way. They were too peopled, so they couldn't go back into the wild. You didn't want them to just um, be sacrificed. So a zoo was a reasonable option for them. But since we have them there, we want to make sure that they're healthy. Um, and so 
how do we define healthy? Well, we look at it relative to welfare and welfare really means stress. And this is beyond just getting veterinary care, having a reasonable facility, having enrichment, but also to make sure that they're not anxious. And anxiety is really defined as overstimulation where there's too much happening um, or understimulation, they are bored. So boredom is also a form of anxiety. And uh, in both cases, you might see what's referred to as abnormal repetitive behavior. It used to be called stereotypy. We do them too. If you hair twirl, this is a stereotypy. You might chew your fingernails, this is a hair stereotypy. The one I hate um, is the leg jiggle. I will be sitting with students and we'll be discussing and next thing you know, the whole table is vibrating. Somebody's got a leg jiggle going on. That's an abnormal repetitive behavior, sometimes the result of too much caffeine, but um, animals do this too. The degree to which it's uh, profound anxiety or just nervous energy, we can't be sure, but this is the best metric we have aside from just looking at hormones. Um, and so um, obviously hormones is, is another way that we, we address that. But behaviorally, it's this abnormal repetitive behavior. This is a study that we just published in February that was four years of looking at um, river otters relative to parenting. There's um, a lot of controversy concerning captive context of whether or not you should allow animals to breed. Um, do we want to perpetuate uh, laboratory-based or um, aquarium-based or zoo-based um, uh, breeding? Well, um, if you're interested in welfare, uh, certainly from our study, much less, considerably less abnormal repetitive behavior when provided opportunities to parent. This is a biologically innate behavior. This is a behavior that they spend an enormous amount of time doing um, in natural contexts. And so if you're wanting to provide a um, realistic experience for your otters, um, that might be one argument. And what you're seeing here, this is Tilly. Um, she is engaged in two different abnormal repetitive behaviors. One is a somersault um, and the other is, um, it, it's called water pacing. But in addition, she had an oral um, uh, abnormal behavior where she essentially thumb sucked, but it was her toes. Um, and so she would do this over and over and over, but it only occurred when she wasn't parenting. Um, when she parented, she had normal otter behavior. She didn't engage in that, um, uh, you know, repeated somersaults or water pacing. And she didn't um, thumb suck or foot suck um, when she was parenting as well. So these are just examples of, of how we might look at that. Relative to Island County and um, what we've found so far, we have several steps of the research that we've been doing. The first was based on um, diet. There was a number of, a number of concerns among um, uh, wildlife management uh, folks that the river otters were contributing to part of the problem of salmon loss. Um, also, there was concern because um, Joseph Gatos uh, did a study a few years ago in the San Juans and found that some of the coastal river otters in the San Juans were consuming um, endangered rockfish. Um, and so our group of, or our population of otters is different, even though they're still part of the Salish Sea. As I mentioned, speciation can occur in really small populations. Otters overwhelmingly do not follow the rules. Alaska river otters will behave different from otters that are in Minnesota, from otters that are in uh, Whidbey, from otters that are on Vancouver Island. And um, they don't follow the rules. So they're super adaptable to whatever is thrown at them in each context. Um, in fact, you'll see them change their activity patterns in July. Uh, they stop being as crepuscular during daylight when people are actively taking to the beaches. You also see changes in behavior around um, flight schedules uh, relative to some of the jets. And so you'll see um, around you know, days where there's lots and lots of noise or activity, you won't see them around as much. Um, and this has been validated over and over and over in the infrared camera footage. So um, 
In terms of the prey diversity among ruby otters, we collected 140 scat samples from January 2019 through 2021, um, and ruby otters predate 54 different species, 11 unknown species that we couldn't identify from remains, um, but found from among 525 different prey collections, 29 latrines along 13 bays, ponds, harbors, and lakes, and over 50% were demersal fish, meaning sculpin and flatfish. Of all of those specimens, only one had a salmon. Um, and that was also actually during um, salmon fishing season. So uh, likely was a byproduct of um, somebody's catch. So um, how do we do this? How do we get this information? Well, we take um, otter, this is actually older otter poo, and yes, that's pink biodegradable glitter on there. Some latrines have up to 40 different deposits and I need to be able to count um, which ones I've collected, which ones are new, which ones are old, and that's the way I do it. It's um, kind of fancy. So you take the scat, you put it in a solution of biodegradable soap with water, you let it stand overnight or for a couple of days, you rinse it out um, in a sieve, it's just a standard two millimeter sieve, a, a stainless steel sieve, and in these uh, very scientific and professional um, dishes, which are roasting pans, turkey roasting pans. They have nice little spots in them where you can put your samples out to dry. You'll notice all the diversity in color because they're all different types of, of prey and sometimes in the same feces. Um, once that's dried, they go into petri dishes and they're sent to Pacific Identifications in Vancouver, Canada, who do anthropolo uh, anthropology related um, analyses, physical anthropology related analyses of bones, um, feathers, and so on. And so um, in addition to predominantly feeding on demersal fish, that is sculpin, flatfish, um, also stickleback, um, there were differences in predation relative to season. And so these are marine fish, freshwater fish, and estuarine fish, crustaceans, amphibians, mammals, and birds. Although um, this shows that birds were predominantly, um, I can't see this very well. I think that says, uh, I think that says fall. Um, but uh, I just took this video um, from an infrared camera uh, at Admiral's uh, Lake and pay attention to what's going on here. This was May 23rd, so less than a month ago. That's a very upset hen duck there. The drake will be by in a minute. Less than a minute. It looks like my... So pay attention right around here. Are people seeing this? Mine feels like it's frozen. There we go. So notice, I'm just gonna sort of speed this along because I feel like it's freezing a little bit. Notice um, what's going on in the mouth there. This is a duckling. So um, he essentially did a lion weight move where he was sitting um, just at the bank and um, the hen came by with her ducklings and from below came up, grabbed one. She quickly ushered her ducklings along um, the bank and um, she managed to grab one. So. Um, Again, they don't follow rules. Um, they will take uh, an opportunity as it presents itself, um, but they also uh, have foraging strategies relative to time of day. Notice dawn and uh, dusk are the two most, um, dawn and morning and dusk and evening are the two uh, 
most active times relative to foraging. You're looking at differences between freshwater and saltwater here. So predominantly looking at coastal foraging because they can. Um, obviously you wouldn't see this in places where the habitat is largely riparian, but you don't have riparian habitat in Island County. And so it's lacoustic. Um, and if it's lacustrine or, or lake uh, or pond, um, usually still they're gonna be near um, saltwater because that's their preferred fish. They have a lot more energy from um, flatfish and sculpin than they do from stickleback or um, tadpoles, which is another preferred resource during tadpole season. Um, the second project that we uh, are doing and is actually underway, this is Aspen. She is my research assistant who just came up. She's a student from Pacific University. And um, she came up, she's collecting fecal samples. Um, this is at uh, one of the citizen scientists' houses um, over in Mutiny Bay. This is um, over uh, by Crockett Lake. Um, we collected 60 different um, samples this last um, May, took them to the zoo. This is Candace, uh, who's at the Oregon Zoo. She is the endocrine wildlife um, lab technician. She will be comparing um, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen, as well as glucocorticoids, the cortisol um, that's associated with stress response between our otters in Island County and the otters um, at the Oregon Zoo, as well as some of their uh, comparative um, uh, sister institutions with the Oregon Zoo, uh, like Woodland Park Zoo, for example. So the third project is um, pending grant funding. We plan to do this again in, in May of next year uh, to look at genetic diversity. And this will include probably some animals in Port Townsend area and the San Juans, obviously Camino and Whidbey as well, but looking to see how related the animals are. A question I often get, is there a chance that these animals are the same critters? Absolutely there is, although coastal otters range is usually five kilometers as opposed to riparian river otters, which can be upwards of 75 kilometers. They don't have to travel far, they keep smaller territories. Um, and so uh, it's unlikely that these are gonna be um, the same animals, but they can certainly be an interrelated population because it is a locked community. Now, are they able to swim from Coopville to Port Townsend? Um, it's certainly plausible. Um, it, it's a likely prospect, but we just don't know. So that would be something that would be interesting to see essentially the range of how far uh, a, a, a community of animals will go. So if we see relatedness there, we certainly know that somebody um, made that trip and that would be useful uh, in terms of better understanding their um, land use and resources. Our fourth project also hoping to occur next May is um, looking at trap pollutant and contaminants among Island County and North American river otters. So again, this would be collecting um, digestive mucus specifically and looking at brominated flame retardants, for example, and um, antibiotics uh, based on exposure from um, the Salish Sea. There have been a number of folks, Stephanie, um, I just forgot her last name. She um, is doing research, uh, Norman, Stephanie Norman. Gosh, mine is a terrible thing to waste. Stephanie Norman is doing research um, looking at antibiotic resistance among these, uh, marine species in the Salish Sea, usually um, looking at pinnipeds, that is um, the seals and sea lions, but also some of the whales as well uh, for antibiotic resistance um, due to exposure. And then the fifth project is ongoing. It will be ongoing until essentially we're, we're um, content with having collected everything that we possibly can um, from Island County. And this is looking at their distribution. And we do this through a algorithm called distance. Um, and it's based on citizen scientists reporting. So if you're interested in this project, um, here is my email. This is my website. Um, my cell phone, um, I am happy to provide as well. Send me an email and I will give you my cell number and you can text me. Just let me know who you are so I can put you in my phone. Um, but I collect narrow carcasses. So if you find a carcass um, and it appears fresh, 
I really appreciate uh, getting the call. Um, uh, and sometimes I am on the island when those calls happen and I can get them the same day. Sometimes I'm not, um, but at least getting the call and being able to document that is useful. Sometimes there, will, there are folks that are um, working with me that would be able to go pick it up. So if that's at all a possibility, I would be grateful. I also collect um, beaver carcass as well. They are an interspecific competitor with um, river otters. And they often frequent the same areas. And so knowing a little bit about what's going on with beaver in the area is equally useful. Um, latrine jelly and um, feces, particularly if it's within 24 hours, it can be tough to see that in um, uh, 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 feces. It usually, if it's mushy and dark, um, it's fresh. And it usually be pretty fragrant. Jelly. Um, is usable for days. So it doesn't have to be 24 hours. So the digestive mucus, and it really does look like that. Imagine someone with a bad cold and they just sneeze on their fecal sample. That's what that, that's what that looks like. Um, and it's largely uh, tissue cells and um, glycoprotein. So it, it is relatively water resistant and um, it travels well and it stores well <clears throat> and it has lots of skin cells. And so that's a great resource. And then just if you see them, if you happen to be um, driving and you see one cross the road or you're out tooling around and you happen to see one in the bay, just make a note of time and the date. Um, weather is useful, but I can look that up. Um, the location, super important. The number of otters, what they're doing, if you can video them, even better. Um, photograph is fine, whatever you can get, all of this information is useful. And so um, would love to have your involvement. And I, I just want to acknowledge this is a small group of people, just recent people that have been really incredibly helpful. And I want to be sure to give Ty Kent of Earthroots Imagery a huge shout out because a lot of my my really good pictures are from him as well as John Ledbetter, um, as well as uh, a little shout out to Russell Link, who um, Val uh, acknowledged with living with wildlife, um, lives in Clinton, great fellow, been very helpful with this research as well. Um, and so just also a few acknowledgements of other folks, including Kamena Wildlife Habitat for having me and for all of you coming. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I'll look in chat. If Thank river you, otters yeah. are freshwater marine. Yeah, if river otters are freshwater marine 30% of the time, where's the other 70%? Land. So um, they nap, they are frequent nappers. So um, you don't see diurnal activity exclusively like you generally see with people. You don't see nocturnal activity like you see with big cats. You see 24 hour possibilities with a river otter, but um, only about 30% of that time is gonna be spent in the water. They may also still hunt on land. Um, they might, may eat birds, they may eat mammals, particularly voles and rabbits are um, uh, preferred. Um, they also take a lot of naps. So um, it's pretty energy draining to be switching from fresh water to salt water. They don't have a lot of fat reserves. It's particularly cold and they have extraordinarily fast metabolism. So imagine from the time that you consume something to the time that it's eliminated, it's 45 minutes for an otter. So they get 45 minutes of that energy use and then that's it. And then they need to take a nap and then they'll do it again. So they'll be frequent foraging 30% of the time having to just recoup that energy. Any other, anything else I can offer? Oh, yes. Do they have any symbiotic relationships with other creatures? Yes. Um, beaver, for example. Um, they can also have competitive relationships with beaver, but um, they coexist with beaver, beaver brilliantly. They coexist with sea otter brilliantly. In fact, I'm uh, involved in the Alaka Alliance in Oregon, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to reintroduce um, sea otters, I think I just said river otters, sea otters <laughs> into Oregon coast. Um, 
We used to have sea otters in Oregon, but um, with their extirpation for hunting, um, it killed off much of our kelp forests. And so there's an attempt to reintroduce kelp, reintroduce sea otter, so that um, obviously the, the um, uh, invertebrates don't take over our kelp. Um, sea urchins in particular are really hard on kelp and that's uh, sea otter's preferred um, food resource. And um, they often are in the same areas and interact well with river otter. And you might be asking why, because they don't eat the same things. Well, um, river otters are vocal. And um, if, and they will not typically be foraging in an area where there are predators. And many of you may have seen that some otters you can set their, your watch to in terms of how frequently they're in a bay or how regularly they're in a particular area. Um, and if this is something that a local population of sea otters sees, which are typically rafting um, populations, they don't leave the area, um, but they can monitor what other um, uh, uh, animals in the area uh, are doing. And if they see the river otters leaving a particular area quickly, um, this alerts generally females um, with offspring, with pups, that there is danger in the area and she'll, she'll move more um, into the kelp forest or move with a number of other uh, sea otters for protection. So there, there are a number of other species that they interact well with. Also the raptors, for example, um, are, are um, a good um, interrelated because they eat heron chicks and they will eat if possible, um, not typically eagle, eagle chicks, but they will also get the leavings from eagles as well. Eagles frequently drop their um, prey resources. If you've watched eagles hunt, they, they lose them a lot. And sometimes they lose them to otters. Um, so Pamela Peterson asked if they're strictly carnivores. For the most part, yes. Um, you don't see them eating a lot of vegetation. Occasionally you'll see them forage on um, kelp and seaweed, but usually it's to get at the crustacean. And so they'll just consume the kelp and seaweed or grass as part of grabbing um, the invertebrates. They eat grub. Um, I mean, they have an enormously diverse diet, but for the most part, it's pretty uh, exclusively carnivorous. Any, anything else? Other questions. You're welcome to unmute if you want to just. Um, I'm sorry. Sarah, Sarah Colt on Camino. Hi, uh, Sarah. Hi. Um, are you familiar with the Onomat Point area of Camino? I'm not. You'll have to. I've been to Camino, but I don't. I don't have local knowledge. The right west side, across from Whidbey, we have a strange situation of the last couple of years. Instead of using wonderful natural resources for their lifestyle, they will come lumping up this big long hill and then up another hill in our community and have found crawl spaces to get into, ripped out the Tyvek stuff and make nests and have their babies there. What's wrong with these guys? <laughs> the natural. Yeah, so nothing's wrong with them, but. Um... But that is uh, an annoying habit that they have. Um, that is one of the ways that I spend my time when I'm on the island is I consult with people to try and remove pesky otters. And um, some folks like, you know, Jan and Carl Smith of Bush Point love their otters. Those images that they have are from trophy cameras that they've put in because they enjoy them so much. Um, others, not so much because they can be odorific. Um, so, you know, the, the, there is no clean way to get rid of river otters. It is a case by case basis. Russell Link provides a number of options. I have not found any of them to work. Um, <laughs> but in, in theory, they work. Um, in application, not as much. So some of the remedies people have been told is like mothballs and a nylon 
They don't like that smell. Um, you pee outside um, the den or the area. Well, they just pee over it. They'll just they'll just sprint over it. Um, it's like arm wrestling. It won't. You won't win. Um, somebody will be on top of somebody else, and it it, it just doesn't work. Um, other things people have done is cayenne, pepper, cinnamon combinations. I mean, there are there are crazy folk remedies for how to get otters out. And in my experience, the way that you get them out is that you dig, you treat, I have chickens, and you treat otters like you treat a coyote. You have to, you have to protect your space as if there were chickens in there. So you have to dig down um, several inches put hardware wire in where they can't get through, they can't dig through. Um, if you use chicken wire, they can bite through that. So chicken wire is no good. You gotta use hardware uh, cloth, which is just like a heavier. My point is they have a wonderful cove area, high bluff yeah. trees and a natural little lake there. And yet they go through, it's a- They go there. Yeah. Why yeah. So yeah, so they go there because it's established and it's protected. So decks are wonderful because other animals aren't using it. So um, they they will they will adjust to you, um, even though other animals won't. And so that's why they're using that spot. And beyond that, I can't tell you why they're willing to do that, other than they're marvelously adaptable. Um, I, I frequently refer to them, if you've ever seen Jurassic Park, there's a scene where he's like, you can see them systematically working through and finding weaknesses. Um, the honors are like that, uh, just without all the blood and dire consequences um, <laughs> as a velociraptor, but very similar. Um, they, they will find the weaknesses in a deck and they will exploit it and they'll take over and they're really hard to get rid of. Um, one thing that can work if you want to get rid of them um, is infrared lighting can help. Some otters respond to that. Not all do, but some do. Um, the key is once you get them out, you treat your deck like it has chickens and you put hardware cloth underneath, make sure there are no holes anywhere, and then you're good. You may still have them coming in your property trying to find another spot, but you won't have them under the deck. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily your question. I can't answer why um, they don't use all of this other area other than other animals are also using that area and they're, they're less likely to have to compete with somebody else in a human made structure because other animals are reluctant to occupy it. Thank you. Could I add something? Um, and when that helps. With our wildlife habitat project, sometimes people get um, upset with the animals and um, usually animals are nuisances because we have provided an opening for them. So it's kind of like making sure we don't have the holes in our decks or the holes or the, the rot that they can get into. So we have to do our, our proofing of our, our places we don't want the new the potential of the nuisance of the animal because they're just opportunists to survive, especially with the dwindling habitat. So it's like we need to think about yep. what we're doing and what we want to protect so that the habitat, they, they have the habitat to um, raise their young and, and live. And so I, I know we have otters um, nearby or have this year is so low. Um, and I just take it as a joy that, um, that they're there. And um, it's a lucky day, but um, and it, I and I don't want them to get the the blame for being the nuisance when we're providing the opportunity for them to be a nuisance. And we really need to think about what we're doing, and also think about that maybe after the babies are gone, so that um, they they get to have their their den is going to complete their their cycle for for bringing up young that year. So that's my two cents. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, because they will come back to the den. So they, they will keep usually three or four dens. Um, they don't have just one primary den. They'll keep several dens. And often um, daughters of mothers who had a den will take her young to a, a natal site. 
So absolutely um, closing off an area once otters have vacated is important. Anything else? I appreciate everybody coming on a sunny day. Heidi, do you know how many otters might live around Camino? I don't. Um, I can give you sort of the, me the metrics that we're um, operating with um, on Whidbey, just because I have a lot more sightings there. Um, and it's uh, three to six every 10 kilometers. And it's an estimate. So three to six every 10 kilometers um, of coastal habitat that doesn't include inland habitat. Um, and so you know, that's our, our fourth project and looking at the genetic diversity that will help establish whether or not we're looking at repeat animals and how long their um, range is. Um, and so that will help in terms of better getting a, a demographic um, uh, descriptives. But right now that's our estimate is three to six every 10 kilometers. Seems like a lot, but good for them. It's a lot. Yep, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. So how does this compare with other places around? Is this like the most dense that they get or is this like pretty? It's pretty uh, dense. Um, there are a lot of otter uh, in the San Juans as well. Although um, just to give you a sense of vulnerability, um, my project was originally not at uh, Whidbey or not in Island County. It was at Blakely Island in the San Juans, which is like 16 miles of island. It's entirely local. In fact, there's no paved roads. You have to be invited to be on the island unless you have property there. Um, and I was collaborating with Seattle Pacific University. I have a, a colleague there from grad school. Um, and he and I were working on the project and I spent uh, my first summer um, on Blakely and uh, really healthy what what my colleague thought was a very healthy otter population had been there for years and years and years was not there and um, turns out that the limited population of otters that were there um, were exposed to canine distemper which is a zoonotic disease that passes from dogs to people to coyotes to, or not, I'm sorry, not to people, dogs to coyotes to otter. Otters are mustelids. Um, although not canine, they, they share similar physiologies um, and they uh, can contract pathogens um, like canine distemper. So somebody's dog or coyote or something, they have a ton of gear. So I'm not sure that they have they have a lot of coyote, but at some point, um, canine distemper was introduced to Blakely and um, the entire otter population was wiped out. So I had to go looking elsewhere. And it turns out that Coopville had, um, right by where we ended up buying a house because my husband and I fell in love with it and decided we are retiring there. Um, we ended up buying a small cabin um, in Coopville and in, in, uh, on Admiralty Bay or just by Admiralty Bay. And um, we discovered it essentially that area. Um, it was not an area that I knew well, but Seattle Pacific had a campus there in uh, Fort EB. And as uh, we were driving through the area, a romp of three otters, kin, kin group of otters ran several feet in front of my vehicle. Fortunately, I was driving really slow as I want to do. And um, I said, oh, this is where we'll be studying. And that's where I stick. And it's been great. And the community has been amazing. Um, I cannot think of anywhere I've ever been. I'm from Alaska. And even folks who are very wildlife centric and ecological, um, there. it's polarized, but tend to be very ecologically sensitive. They're um, nowhere near as um, wonderful as the people on Island County have been. So um, I've been delighted to be involved, but that's really, that's how vulnerable um, just one population is. It, can, it just takes one pathogen and if they have no immunities, they're gone. So um, I don't remember what I was, why I went on this rabbit hole, but 
We're talking about how many there were. So have, okay. have, have yeah. they repopulated that area on Blakely? My knowledge, no. Mm -mm. Nope. Um, although I don't know about this this summer, so it'll be something I'll have to check in with Bain about, but um, they weren't there last year and they weren't there the year before, so oh. um, likely that population established there because they swam from Lopez or from San Juan Island or, or Orcas, um, more likely Orcas, um, and then established that area. There are an enormous number of deer there. Eric Long from Seattle Pacific University st studies the deer and they have really an insane number of deer on the island. So, I, you know, I'm not sure um, if the uh, habitat is conducive for all of these large animals, even though deer are not carnivores, they still occupy a lot of habitat. So I'm not sure why they haven't re-colonized um, that area, but they haven't, to my knowledge. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> appreciate you spending your Wednesday with me. We really appreciate you sharing. Feel free this. to send it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Heidi. So I'll put yeah, the, your you. contact information up on the website. So we'll have a recording, and uh, hope that if anybody has any otter sightings, they'll share them with you. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.